Good morning. Today we are going to review the mechanical wave topics covered on the AP Physics 1 exam. Hey guys. Hey Ball. Hi, hi Ball. Flippin' Physics. Let's start with the concept of a single wave pulse. Here I've drawn a rope, a spring, or a string through which a wave pulse is traveling. Actually, it could even be the side view of the surface of a lake. The important piece to understand here is that a wave is a disturbance traveling through a medium. It is not the motion of the medium itself. That disturbance or wave pulse is energy traveling through the medium. And the overall displacement of the medium after the wave pulse has passed by is equal to zero. As the wave goes through the medium, the rope goes up and down and returns back to where it started. So a wave is not a physical object. It is energy moving through a medium as a disturbance of that medium. Sending multiple wave pulses down at specific even time intervals will create periodic waves. There are two types of mechanical waves. One is called a transverse wave. In a transverse wave, the disturbance of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. For example, in this transverse wave, which I've drawn on the board, the direction of wave propagation, the wave pulse, is moving to the right, and the disturbance of the medium is up and down, which is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Examples of transverse waves are ripples in a pond and waves on a rope. The second type of mechanical wave is a longitudinal wave. Bo, how is a longitudinal wave different from a transverse wave? In a longitudinal wave, the disturbance of the medium is parallel to the direction of wave propagation. Correct. The only difference between these two definitions is that single word. For transverse, it is perpendicular, and for longitudinal, it is parallel. Examples of longitudinal waves are sound waves in air and the waves that travel through the surface of the planet after an earthquake or a large explosion, which are called seismic waves. So far, every wave we've talked about requires a medium to travel through. However, there is one type of wave that does not require a medium. Bobby, what is that wave? Electromagnetic waves do not need a medium to travel through. And electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, right? Yeah. They are alternating electric and magnetic fields. Electromagnetic waves do not require a medium to travel through, so they can propagate through the vacuum of space, and they are transverse waves. Now, let's take a closer look at this graph of a periodic transverse wave. The top part of a wave is called a crest, the bottom part is called a trough, and the distance between two successive crests. Billy, what is that called? The distance between two successive crests is called the wavelength. And the symbol for wavelength is a lowercase lambda, and the height of a crest or the depth of a trough is called the amplitude. Oh, right. And, and the higher the amplitude, the larger the amount of energy in the wave. And Bo, if I replace the horizontal axis with time, what would the time between two crests be called? The time between two crests? Oh yeah, that's the period. Right, because the period is the time it takes for one wavelength to pass by a point. And Bobby, this is a graph of a transverse wave. What change could I make to the graph to make it a graph of a longitudinal wave? Uh... Oh, oh uh, change the y-axis to density. For a longitudinal wave, you have density on the y-axis. Therefore, a crest is a location of high density or compression, and a trough is a location of low density or rarefaction. That is why a longitudinal wave is sometimes called a compression wave. Bo, what is the equation for velocity? Velocity equals change in displacement over change in time. 
Actually, x stands for position. Delta x is displacement. So velocity equals change in position over change in time. Right. Velocity equals change in position over change in time. And if the wave has gone through a distance of one wavelength, how long did that take? Billy? Um... The wavelength is the distance a wave travels during one full cycle, and the period is the time it takes for one full cycle. So, the time for one wavelength is the period. Yeah. And frequency equals one over the period, therefore... The velocity of a wave equals its frequency times its wavelength. Now, a lot of the terms we're using and the graphs we're drawing are very similar to the ones we use for simple harmonic motion, because simple harmonic motion and waves are related. Absolutely true. However, simple harmonic motion does not have a wavelength. So please, do not find wavelength for simple harmonic motion, and do not use this equation for the velocity of a wave for simple harmonic motion. Please. Now, Bobby, is a wave a physical object? A wave is not a physical object. It is energy in the form of a disturbance of a medium. Which means two physical objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. However, two waves can occupy the same space at the same time. And we determine what happens using something called superposition. Superposition is the description of how waves interfere with one another when they occupy the same space. Basically, we add the amplitudes together. Let's say we have two wave pulses in a rope moving toward one another. Now, I've identified them as blue and red to better visualize what's happening, but realize it's all one rope. Now, let's take a look at what happens a few moments later when both wave pulses occupy the same space. The amplitudes, or energies, add together to create one larger wave pulse. This is called constructive interference, and it is important to understand what happens after the waves interfere with one another. The two waves continue on their way, unaffected by the constructive interference that occurred when the two occupied the same space. Now let's look at what happens when the amplitudes are not on the same side of the rope. Because the two interfering wave pulses are of equal magnitudes and opposite directions, they end up canceling one another out completely. This is called total destructive interference. Now, you can have destructive interference or partial destructive interference if the magnitudes of the amplitudes are different. Again, it is important to realize that the two wave pulses continue on afterwards unaffected by what happened when the two occupied the same space, even though when they did occupy the same space, the rope was entirely flat because they completely canceled one another out. Now, let's talk about standing waves. What I've drawn here is a rope that is fixed at one end, that end is stationary. And I'm sending wave pulses down that when they run into that fixed end, they are going to be reflected, meaning they'll come back, and they will be inverted, which means they switch sides. And if I continue to send wave pulses down the rope, those wave pulses will interfere with the reflected and inverted wave pulses, both constructively and destructively, to create what are called standing waves. This is how we draw standing waves. Notice L, the length of the rope, and I've set up different standing wave patterns in the rope. These dotted lines represent locations the rope could be at some point in time. So the rope is moving up and down here, up and down here, up and down here. Notice where it's not moving up and down, these locations right here, which are locations of total destructive interference, which are called nodes. And we have locations of constructive interference, which are called 
antinodes. Now, let's determine the wavelength of each of the waves in these standing wave patterns in terms of L. Billy, in the first standing wave pattern, which has one antinode and two nodes, how many wavelengths equals L, the length of the rope? With one antinode, there is only half a wavelength in the distance of the length of the string L. Correct, and therefore the wavelength of the wave equals two times L, the length of the standing wave. And we already know the velocity of a wave equals its frequency times its wavelength. Therefore, the frequency of the standing wave pattern is equal to the velocity of the wave divided by its wavelength, or the velocity of the wave divided by two times the length of the rope. Bobby, could you please do the same thing with the next standing wave pattern, which has two antinodes and three nodes? Uh, let's see, um, one wavelength equals L, so the frequency equals the velocity divided by the wavelength, or the velocity divided by the length of the string. Very nice. And Bo, could you please do the last standing wave pattern, which has three antinodes and four nodes? Okay, with three antinodes and four nodes, there are one and a half wavelengths in the length of the string, which means the wavelength equals two times the length divided by three, and therefore the frequency equals three times the velocity divided by two times the length of the string. Thank you. Believe it or not, we're creating a pattern here, which is easier to see when I rewrite the equations this way. They are 1, 2, and 3 times the velocity of the wave on the string divided by 2 times the length of the string. Which gives us the equation for the frequency or the sound we hear coming from a stringed instrument, like a guitar or a cello and this n is called the harmonic number. When n is equal to 1, it is called the fundamental frequency, or the first harmonic. When the harmonic number is equal to 2, it's called the second harmonic. When n is equal to 3, it's called the third harmonic, and so on and so forth. Just so you know, we hear the frequency of sound as pitch. For example, concert pitch, the A above middle C, is typically 440 hertz. All right, now let's do the same thing we just did, only with wind instruments. And let's start with what is called an open pipe instrument, which is open at both ends, like a flute. Actually, we don't really need to do anything because the equation for an open pipe wind instrument is exactly the same as the one for a stringed instrument. Remember, an open pipe instrument, open on both ends. And the reason for that is because an open end creates an antinode. So the pictures look almost identical, except they are inverted. In other words, for example, for this first one, we end up with antinodes on either end and one node in the middle. But again, it gives you the exact same equation. So, we're going to move on and talk about a closed pipe instrument, which is closed on one end and open on the other. In a closed pipe wind instrument, the closed end creates a node and the open end creates an antinode. Therefore, for the fundamental frequency of a closed pipe instrument, one-fourth of the wavelength fits for the length of the pipe, and therefore the wavelength is equal to four times the length of the pipe. And we know the velocity equals frequency times the wavelength, and therefore the frequency is equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength, or the velocity divided by 4L. So notice the difference here. Rather than having two times the length of the string or the length of the open pipe for the open pipe instrument, we have for a closed pipe instrument, it is divided by four times the length of the closed pipe instrument. Which gives us the equation for a closed pipe instrument m times v over 4l instead of 2l, and m instead of n, because m, the harmonic number for a closed pipe instrument, can only be odd, 1, 3, 5, etc. And please realize 
that standing waves can only be set up in strings and wind instruments at specific wavelengths, and that's determined by the length of the string or pipe. Now, as long as we're talking about music, let's talk about beat frequency. If you play two notes that are close to one another in frequency, then the interference of those two frequencies with one another will cause periodic changes in the amplitude of the sound, which sounds like beats. In other words, if we play one note by itself, which is 440 hertz, we hear just that note. And if we play another note by itself, which is 441 hertz, we will also hear just that one note. However, if we play both together, we hear a beat frequency. And that beat frequency is equal to the absolute value of 441 minus 440, or one cycle per second, or one beat per second. If we play 442 and 440 hertz, we hear two beats per second. two frequencies that are near one another and the interference of those two waves. One last concept, the concept of the Doppler effect. This is a visual representation of the sound coming from a single frequency stationary sound source. And each one of these lines is called a wave front and represents a crest. Therefore, Bobby, what is the distance between each wave front or the distance between each crest called? The distance between two successive crests is the wavelength of the wave. Now, let's draw the same sound source moving to the right. As the sound source moves to the right, the wave fronts to the right of the sound source are closer together and therefore the wavelength is decreased. What we really want to know is what we hear. Billy, what happens to frequency? Well, the velocity of a wave equals frequency times wavelength. So the frequency equals velocity divided by wavelength. So then frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. So as the sound source moves towards the observer, the wavelength will be de decreased, and therefore the frequency will be increased, and the pitch will sound higher. Notice that the reverse is true as the sound source is moving away from the observer. As the source is moving away from the observer, the wavelength is increased, and therefore the frequency is decreased. So it sounds like this. Meow. <laughs> yes. And this change in frequency heard by the observer is called the Doppler effect. We have reached the end of my review lesson about mechanical waves. My next review lesson is about electrostatics. You are more than welcome to enjoy that video. You can also visit my website, flippingphysics.com, where you can find all of my AP Physics 1 review lessons organized with lecture notes. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.